street preaching this Saturday at 1 p.m., 24th and City Brew parking lot, and then also Saturday, July 9th. I'll have a map by Wednesday for the exact spot we'll be meeting, just so it's real clear. Um, and then I'm going to put out a sign-up sheet as well, just so I know who's coming. It'll help with getting vehicles and figuring out who's driving what, whatnot. So. Glad Brother Paul said that about the Strawberry Festival. I've never been to it either. I it's pretty cool. It's nice weather. All right. So. And they have they run a farmers market and everything. And that, I think it starts at nine. So if you guys want to go to it, I mean it starts at nine. But there's a we're planning to meet at eleven. So we'll get more details on that. We went through the tracks this afternoon. We have we have quite a few over there. I think we have enough, but probably time to order some more after we use them up there. But. Um, Let's let's uh, try to be there. Try to be a part of that. Get your strawberry shortcake or whatever you stand in line for for three blocks. Yes. Well, they think uh, that book is uh, fifty percent off the case. Oh yeah. You could get a case of oh, tracks. Just, just one. Okay. Well, they don't want to give it away. Okay, I'll think about that then. All right. Well, let's get Matthew chapter thirteen this afternoon. Matthew thirteen. Got one question on my desk. I might uh, do that next week or wait for one or two more to come in. <coughs> but uh, last time we were in Matthew was the end of Matthew 12. I preached on uh, the press and what's keeping people from Jesus Christ and uh, his mother and brother and standing without. That was Matthew 12. And then there's a so somewhat of a natural break here in the book of Matthew. Uh, so starting in Matthew 13, Jesus begins uh, speaking in parables to the disciples, and he's going to go through this, this whole chapter and give them the parable of the sower and the seed, and we've been over that in detail, so we won't hit that in quite as much detail today. Uh, then he gives them the sower that went out in the field and sowed, and then somebody came and put tares in the field, and he gets into the parable of the mustard seed and the mustard tree that grows from that seed, and uh, then he talks about a treasure hid in a field and the church being like a pearl of great price. And this is the, the kingdom parables. Uh, they're all about the kingdom of heaven. And it's important. Most of you, I think, were here for the lessons on the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, just for review, is the physical kingdom on this earth that you are living in right now. This is the kingdom of heaven. Do you need something? Well, I need something. I'm not sure. That's all right. Got all the kids yeah. counted for? All right. We feel better. So, all right, so the kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of God. If you got saved, you got placed in the kingdom of God. If you're living and breathing and you have a king over you or a ruler or a president or you live in a nation, you're a part of the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven, just remember this in looking at these parables, it continues and extends from Calvary all the way through the New Testament and continues from Calvary all the way through to the tribulation. Pause. All right. <clears throat> Maybe we should read a verse and pray or something. <laughs> verse 1. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside. And a great multitude, great multitudes, were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Lord, I ask you to bless the lesson this evening. I ask you to bless these uh, parables that we're looking at here that we find out where they fit and find out how to understand them a little bit. You called them a mystery, and maybe we won't get every last detail wrung out of them, but Lord, I ask you please help us to um, make sense of them. I ask that you lead and guide in this lesson. It can be taught and preached a lot of different ways. I ask that um, you just direct in this hour that you'd be pleased with uh, what we say. You'd be pleased with how our heart responds and receives it, and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, turn to Mark 4. Hold your place in Matthew 13. Go to Mark 4. Mark 4. <clears throat> this is the parallel passage. In verse 1, 
And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship. He enters into the ship because there's a great multitude. How many of you have ever been out on the water and heard how your voice carries over the water? If you've ever been on a fishing trip with other people, you can hear conversations from a thousand yards away on a calm lake, and it's just like, like they're right next to you. And so Jesus uses the advantage of that water. And I can't help but think back in Genesis 1 when it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep and God said, imagine the voice of God across those waters of the face of the deep that caps this universe. Let there be light. And, and the whole thing resonates with the frequency of God's voice and makes light. No sun yet, just light from God, from that uh, resonation of his voice, I suppose. So he's sitting here again in a much smaller capacity and a little boat floating out on the little sea that he made. And he says, I know how to get everybody to be able to hear me without losing my voice. He entered into the ship and he sat in the sea and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables. Now notice this in verse two and said unto them in his doctrine. So doctrine can be learned from parables, and that's important that you understand that when Jesus is speaking in parables, it's not just a story that we take it and mean whatever we want it to mean. Those parables contain doctrine. You turn back to Mark, Matthew chapter 13, and the doctrine that you learn is explained in some of the parables, and the Lord expects you to take what he taught you in some of the parables and apply it to the other parables. How many of you know in the sower and the seed what the field is going to represent? The field is the, is the world. And then you get to the next one, and he explains the next one, and it says the field again was sown some seed, and he says in the explanation again, and the field is the world. You say, well, those are two different parables. Yes, they are, and the field is the world. So you should know that the field is the world when you get to the third parable. The field is not the church, and the Catholics teach that it's the church, and they're the tree of the mustard seed, and the fowls are all the Christians in the church. We already know what the fowls are. The fowls are the devils. And so maybe it is their church. But they have a they have an interesting interpretation there because they forgot the explanation that Jesus gave for the parable right previous to it. So it doesn't mean whatever we want it to mean. It means what Jesus Christ explains it to mean, and you compare Scripture with Scripture to determine the Scripture's meaning. So in back in Matthew 13, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Look at verse 4. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. Forthwith they sprang up, but because, because they had no depth, deepness of earth, and when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. And this is how he ends this parable to the multitudes of people, so many hundreds or thousands of people he had to get in the boat. Verse 9, who hath ears to hear, let him hear, period. Goodbye. See, I don't believe that, that Jesus would, would act like that. People make a Jesus in their own mind that doesn't match the Bible all the time. The Jesus of some people's mind gives them whatever they want, whenever they want, and they go to the Lord in prayer, and they think that God's hearing and answering everything they do, and they're just doing things on their own terms. And Jesus doesn't do things on your terms. He, do, he does things that are righteous, and he does things that are pleasing to the Father, and he does everything good. And when he spoke to thousands of people there and said, a guy went out in the field and threw a bunch of seed and it landed in a bunch of different places, good day. Jesus said, that's what those people needed to hear. Now, why would he do that? <clears throat> Let's get one step beyond that. You think Jesus is just rude? No, I don't think Jesus was rude. I don't think Jesus is being uh, cruel or unkind or mean or inconsiderate to people. Look at what happens in verse 10. You have your answer in verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto who? What's the next word? Them. He says to the disciples, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Now, do you know that that's the 12 disciples that came there? Or could that be the 70 disciples? Or could it have been hundreds of disciples? Jesus had more than 12 disciples. 
But whoever came up to him afterwards and asked him personally the question, how come you don't teach it to them where they can understand all of it? Then he gave them some more advanced information. Verse 12, whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he that he shall have more abundance. And whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Now, that's not a very communistic approach in Jesus Christ's uh, economical view of things. You know what Jesus says? If somebody has something, let's give him more so he's prosperous. If somebody doesn't have anything, we're in Matthew 13, 12. If somebody doesn't have anything, let's take it from them because they're not using what they got, and let's give somebody who's going to do something with it. Look over at uh, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. People get this. Um, um, they kind of get this pity party attitude when things don't go their way and they don't have very much or they get their eyes on somebody else that has wealth or riches or fame or something they desire. And they say, man, I feel sorry for myself that I don't have all that. And the Lord's not interested in that attitude. A lot of times, a friend of mine a couple weeks ago, he said, you know, there's a law. It's called the law of scarcity where you're so scared to be generous and giving and take what you have and be productive with it that you just hold it and hoard it for yourself and you never give it away and then you're never prosperous yourself. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Matthew 25, Jesus did this another time here. And look in verse... Um, verse 24, Matthew 25, 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. That's worse than a hard man. That's accusing him of being a thief. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. I mean, you've heard about this it's kind of a buzzword in the last 10 years, the uh, extreme ownership, own the thing, right? Uh, make it yours. You know, this servant, he never understood ownership. He never took that talent and made it his. He calls it the Lord. He says, I went and hid thy talent in the earth. It wasn't his talent. The Lord gave it to him to own and to do whatever he wanted with it. But he never owned it. Lord, there thou hast, that is thine. I'm giving you back exactly what you gave me. 26, his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Jesus never defends his own reputation. He just agrees with them. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money, uses his own language and his own pronouns, my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Now here's the same thing and the same result in verse 28 as the parables. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. What in the world is the Lord doing here? I know an old, old preacher one time, and he was preaching on the vessels of the lady in the Old Testament that Elisha came to, or Elijah came to, and he said, uh, Lady, what have you got in the house? And she said, I don't have anything in the house except, and he said, except what? Except a pot of oil. And he said, you need to take that oil and you need to pour that out into all the vessels. Go to your neighbors and borrow vessels and borrow not a few. And the preacher said this. She, he said, she was undervaluing her resources. And the Lord's given you something. And I don't know what it is for individual people. But the more you get to know somebody, the more you kind of understand. They have gifts and abilities that uh, you have gifts and abilities that I don't have. Somebody asked me the other day, another preacher, he said, how many people in your church do you invite to your church and, and they're there because you invited them. And I was like, pretty much none. <laughs> Not because I haven't been trying. And then the Lord sends people to the church and they invite people and bring their family and bring their friends and bring more friends and then more family and then people get saved and then whether they come to church or not, they get saved and they're a blessing to the ministry. And how does that work? I just had to learn to be okay with that. I have another friend that is a pastor, and he invites people to church all the time, and half the church is people he invited. I didn't make him that way, and I didn't make me this way. You know what the Lord's given me? The Lord's given me the ability to do some things that can be a blessing to the body of Christ, and it's just going to have to be okay with me if that's what the Lord gave me. 
and it's going to just have to be okay with you with what the Lord gave you that he didn't give brother, sister, so-and-so that sits next to you. And then the Lord gets the increase, and you're supposed to be glorifying him anyways with it, so why do you care about your reputation and what anybody else thinks anyways? You say, I just have this one little talent. Well, the reason he only got one is because he knew he wasn't going to do anything with it anyways. <laughs> but I wonder if the guy that had ten got one to start with the first time too. And then the next time he got five, and the next time he got ten. And the Lord wants to see what you'll do with the one. And when you take that one, and you say, this is only a small thing, Lord, but would you bless it, and I'll invest it, and I'll bring it back to you with some increase, and with some interest, and with some usury, or with some uh, doubling my returns over a couple years. Lord, would you please help me know how to take this thing and make it prosperous and bountiful for you? Then the Lord will do that. And then you grow, and the Lord gives you something else. And then you grow, and the Lord gives you something else. And that's the entire Christian life until you decide one day and say, I'm done, I don't want to grow anymore. And then you just become a thorn in some church's side until you get uncomfortably pushed out. <laughs> well, don't be that. You don't have to be that. Whosoever hath, to him shall be given. Everybody starts with something. And he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away. You say, well, that's, that sounds like uh, the exact opposite of communism. Well, turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts 4. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Verse 32, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Now that's the verse that Karl Marx used in his Communist Manifesto to teach that everybody should have all things common. I don't think he quoted verse 31 about being filled with the Holy Ghost. I think he forgot that part. But in the church, especially here at the beginning where the church is getting started, these men here had all things common. And who did they give to? Verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had what? Need. Need. Now you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a communist and I'm going to just give away everything I have and we're going to have all things equal. And somebody else says, no, I'm going to go the other extreme and we're going to have capitalism and capitalism is the answer because conservatives believe in capitalism so it must be spiritual. And the answer is that the world can never figure it out and the world will never figure it out. Another part of that answer, you don't have to turn there, Jesus said, the poor you have with you always in Mark 14:7. So he didn't say take all the money from the rich and give it to the poor like Robin Hood. And he didn't say be capitalistic. He said give to people that have need. And he didn't say always give to people that have need. He said take it from the guy that has and give it to somebody that's going to do something with it. The guy that doesn't have much. Give it to somebody that's going to do something with it. You say what is the answer in all these things? The answer is that you do what is right for that situation according as the Lord leads you. And there's no way that you're going to figure it out without the scriptures. And based on that instance, there's not going to be an answer in this world that matches the scripture. But as a Christian, you can do right with what the Lord gives you, whether it's talents and abilities, whether it's gifts, whether it's money, whether it's time, whatever it is that the Lord's given you, you can do right with it by simply seeking the Lord and asking him what you should do. Amen, amen. That's so simple. It's so simple. Go back to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Look in verse 9 again. Matthew 13 and verse 9. It says, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Sounds kind of rude when Jesus is saying that. Like he's saying it to people that just heard him talking, but all they heard was a bunch of noise. And I know that it happens in any any speech. It happens on Sunday morning in any sermon. Some people are hearing, and all they're hearing is the noise. 
and other people are listening intently and trying to learn something from it, then the difference is the guy that wants to hear and has ears can hear, and the guy that doesn't is going to miss it every time. The Lord never makes anybody listen to his words. If you would, turn to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. The Lord's looking for somebody that wants to hear what he has to say because of who is saying it. If it's the Lord saying it, you should want to hear it. And if it's some preacher just giving you his own opinions and his own ideas, well, that's good to listen to, too, anyways. Listen to his own ideas and talk about them later. <laughs> I would much rather have a congregation that, that has roast preacher for lunch and discusses over the table what was said that was right or wrong about the sermon than people that don't listen at all and don't even pay attention. I would love to be questioned on a sermon because the first my first thought would be, oh, you you heard that part? You are paying attention? Yeah. <laughs> Usually when people call me out, I already know I slipped up and said the wrong thing about, about half the time. Sometimes I have to listen to it again. But I would much rather have that than somebody's not listening. Look at Deuteronomy 6. This is what you're supposed to do in your home with, with uh, God's words. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. This is Moses giving the commandments to the people. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. You ought to take the scriptures, whether it's from the preaching or whether it's from reading the Bible in your home or whatever it is, and talk about them in your house. When thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. The scriptures ought to be on your word, on your mouth all day long, and it ought to be in your home, and you ought to talk about it. And was that thing true that that preacher said? What do you think about that verse of scripture that I've never heard anybody explain it to where I just understand it all? What do you think about this thing? In Luke chapter 24, Jesus is on the road to Emmaus there talking with the disciples and they don't know it's him. And after he vanishes out of their sight, they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us, Luke 24, 32, while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? There's something about taking the scriptures after you've heard them and after you've heard other people speak them and then you talk about them yourselves and chew on them and consider the things that were said. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. In verse 11, back in Matthew 13, he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And that is such a harsh thing. To them it is not given. Why would God take a group of people and say, I'm not going to give it to you? Well, one reason, one reason is because they didn't come up to him afterwards and ask for the interpretation of it. Look in verse 13. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. Well, that sounds backwards. And seeing ye shall see and not perceive. Your eyes are open, you're taking in light, but you're not getting it. And what's the issue? The issue is always, verse 15, this people's heart is waxed gross. You want to know the whole entire issue of the whole entire thing? Is that the Lord is speaking to somebody who's got their heart tuned into what he's saying, and he doesn't give it to the people whose heart is waxed gross and their eyes are dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Turn to Ezekiel 8. Turn back to Ezekiel 8. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. talked about elders this morning in the stages of growth and everybody's growing towards that age whether they mature into that or not I found an interesting place back in the second kings where Elisha is at his house and it says he's at his house with all the elders and the elders are giving him advice and I thought why in the world does Elisha the prophet of God that speaks directly to God and God speaks directly to him I mean, he tells the elders at the, at the thing, this guy's coming over to my house, and he's a son of a murderer, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell him, you know, what's happening to him in his kingdom. Why is he surrounding himself with elders? 
Elisha thought that he had uh, that he thought it was wise to have people around him that were older than him to give him counsel and advice and leadership decisions, even though he speaks directly to God. Sometimes people are afraid to talk to other people about their problems because they get this idea, well, I have a Bible and I have prayer, so I should be able to figure it all out on my own. Why did Elisha need elders? Why did Moses need elders? He's on his face before the Lord in every other chapter. He's climbing a mountain and getting his face glowing, and then he has elders go with him to Pharaoh and elders all through the, the promised land. And then Joshua has elders with him, and the people continued to serve the Lord their God as long as the elders that overlived Joshua were still alive. God puts elders in your life for your protection and for your uh, advice, for, for them to give you advice and for their counsel. And the Lord wants to use those men, and the Lord isn't limited to just speaking to you directly. Sometimes he wants to tell you through somebody else. Look in Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel had some elders around him. Came to pass in the sixth year. I'm talking about the heart here in just a minute. Came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month. Boy, don't go to the next day. That's a bad one. <laughs> As I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me. Everybody got the scene? Everybody's kind of sitting cross-legged on a dirt floor or leaning on couches and chairs or whatever it is. That the hand of the Lord fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness of the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh the jealousy. That's not a good thing that he took him to. And where's all the elders left? I don't know if he picked him up in his physical body. It's not what it says. By a lock of his head. Does your spirit have a lock of your head? I think it's got to be your body. His hand just reaches into the room. Elijah starts levitating. Or Ezekiel, I mean, start, and he just carries him out of the room. And then he sits him in a different place. And all the elders are sitting there. What in the world's going on? Yeah. Now, maybe it all happened spiritually. I don't, you can preach it however you want when it's your turn. But... Verse 4, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel is there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. And what does he see? While all those elders are sitting there on the floor staring at each other or wondering why Elijah, Ezekiel's tripping out of the frame or whatever he's doing here, God carries him over and he puts him in a place. In verse 7, He brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And he digs through that hole in the wall and finds a door. He says, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping thing and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Somebody's doing some paintings on these walls with idolatry. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. In this image, he sees all these ancient men, these elders that are, he's sitting in front of in his house. He's seeing these ancient men here that are part of this idolatry. Verse 12, he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. And he, also said, he said also unto me, Turn yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brings them to women weeping for Tammuz. And then he sees in verse 16 a bunch of men there that are standing inside in between the porch and the altar. In verse 16, 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. Verse 18, Therefore will I deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, and though, though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Hear who? The ancients and the elders of the house of Israel. Turn to 14, Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14, 1, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me, same as before. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? So the elders are there coming to Ezekiel for some advice, and Ezekiel needs the elders for their advice. 
And then the Lord shows up and interrupts the whole thing and says, I'm not interested in anything they have to say, Ezekiel. <coughs> and I'm not going to give them an answer. They're coming and asking you questions, and I'm not going to give them an answer that, uh, that answers what they're looking for because of their heart. How is the Lord going to answer them? Now we're talking about the heart. Look at verse 6. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. That's what we read in chapter 8. For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up his idols in his heart, and put the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. Here's how he's going to answer. I will set my face against that man, and I will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of the people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And, verse 9, if the prophet be deceived, when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and will stretch out my hand upon him, and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel, and they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. <coughs> Now, this is a little more of an advanced lesson here. But what is all that based on? That's all based on a man deciding in his heart that he wants to hear what God has to say or deciding in his heart that he's going to do whatever he wants as idolatry and then God gives you an answer according to your heart. And I didn't write this book. The Lord wrote this book. And he says, I take credit for a man trying to seek me and trying to find an answer for me, I'll take credit for that man being deceived. I deceived that prophet because of the idols in his heart and the people's heart that came to him. Oh, how about uh, a couple examples? How about the founder of the Mormon religion, Joseph Smith? What happened to him? Well, he's playing around with his little seer stones, looking in a little top hat and trying to see which one's glowing on or off and telling everybody that he's writing words from the Lord that are inspired for a new version, a new volume of scripture. Uh, how about Buddha sitting under a tree there meditating and trying to find out about the oneness of the universe? How about, uh, how about Muhammad? What's Muhammad doing? Oh, same thing, sitting under a tree and then somebody gets, he gets recruited by his uh, cousin, his wife's cousin who's in the Catholic church and Muhammad gets recruited and begins this uh, uh, Islamic religion and claims that an angel came and spoke to him and then he transliterate he, he gave the words to somebody else to write down claims that he saw an angel from God how about the Pope what's the Pope do he sits in a chair and claims that he's ex cathedra out of the chair anything he says in that chair is infallible and cannot be altered and cannot contradict anything else and then they contradict each other all the time the popes have in the past and who's deceiving them? You say, it's got to be the devil. Did he set up an idol in his heart? Verse 4. Verse 3, son of man, these men have set up their idol in their heart. Verse 9, if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken the thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. I will stretch out my hand upon him and destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Say, what's the application of this? Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You'd better keep that heart right. You know, you can be a Christian that sins and falls and just man falls seven times and rises yet again, and if you keep your heart right with the Lord, the Lord will straighten out all the screw-ups in your life if your heart's right. You know what Peter's saving grace was at the end of the thing? His heart was always right, even when his mouth was saying the stupidest things. Even when his brain was running off and swinging swords around and cussing and swearing and getting mad at everybody except himself. What was, what was going on in his heart? Thou art the Christ. You're the Son of God. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. That was all Peter. And Peter kept his heart right in the midst of the thing. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, I cried with my whole heart, hear me, O Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. In Proverbs 4, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. When you put the scripture in your mind and in your heart over and over and over and over, that's how you keep your heart right, and that's how you keep in a relationship with the Lord. Uh, 
the church would be way, way bigger if I just made everybody feel good every Sunday. But I am not the mediator between God and men. It's the man Christ Jesus, and you go to him directly. And when you talk to the Lord directly, you don't need a church to get a hold of God. You need a church to tell you how to stay right with God. In Joel 2, there were some elders there. Now oh, turn to it. we got time. Turn to Joel 2. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Find Daniel, keep going. <clears throat> Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Those elders in Ezekiel never do get right. In chapter 20, the same thing happens again. But in Joel 2, you have a different situation. Joel 2, 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, and let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. You know what happens here? These elders and these priests and these whole people come out for a special assembly and they say, we need to have a time of repentance. There were some people not so very long ago in Ezekiel's day that were standing between the porch and the altar with their backs to the temple and their faces toward the sun, worshiping the sunrise. I didn't read all the verse in, in Ezekiel 8. And here's some people that are standing between the porch and the altar and they're facing the tabernacle and they're saying, Lord, we need to repent. We need to turn our backs on what we did before and what those elders did before. And they have their hearts right with the Lord. And then the Lord begins to bless them. In the book of Joel, he gives them some amazing prophecies and some prosperity about that place getting restored in Jerusalem. You know, the last mention of elders in Scripture is in Revelation three times. It mentions the elders there, the 20 and four elders gathered around the throne. And every time they're mentioned, they're falling on their faces and worshiping, falling on their faces and worshiping, falling on their faces and worshiping. That's a good picture of what an elder ought to get to in his Christian life, where he comes and sees the sufferings of this life and he accepts them as from God. And then he comes to the Lord and says, Lord, I want to worship you and glorify you and be partaker of that glory. Thank you for letting me finish my Sunday morning message. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, when a man keeps his heart right, the Lord will straighten out all the kinks in his head. You may not have all the intelligence. You may not have all the social skills and the magnetic personality and you might not have all the wisdom of the ancients, but when you keep your heart right, the Lord will direct you and guide you, and those other things will get taken care of in the Lord's time. And he has a way of just blessing a situation when a guy has a joyful spirit and a heart that's <coughs> seeking to please the Lord. Look back in Matthew 13, verse 15. This people's heart is waxed gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Is he talking to every single person that is there that day? No, he's not. There's a number of people that came up to him and disciples are following him everywhere. But blessed are your eyes, 16, for they see and your ears, for they hear. Verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. We live in a really special time right now. Many people desire to see the things that we're seeing today. There's no way you could read that Old Testament 500 years ago and figure out how everybody was going to be able to know what everybody else was doing globally and worldwide and all getting united together with the, the confederation of nations in Revelation or even in the Old Testament uh, with the books of Daniel and see how those kings were going to all join together and all turn together and have a, a statue of gold and iron legs and feet with iron mingled with clay. What in the world is that about anyways? If you don't know what that's about, just get on U.S. Robotics and YouTube.com and look it up. Have you seen the new robots? 
it's iron mingled with clay, like real faces, like you don't know it's a robot talking to you until the camera zooms out and you see it's kind of moving a little funny. Uh, those, those, that stuff today is all coming together, and many prophets and many wise men have desired to see the things which you're seeing today and have not seen them because of their timing, because they were put in a different place in time. Now you're getting to see it. Don't miss it. These parables are going to explain some of that. Look in verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, which kingdom are we in according to the book of Matthew? Kingdom. kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Kingdom of heaven. You say it says kingdom of God in a different passage. It sure does, but let's make sure we apply this passage because the wording is different to the kingdom of heaven. And anyone heareth the words of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in the heart. That's the fowl that ate the seed. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. He that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon. I don't know if anybody uses that word today. Anon means immediately or right away. And anon with joy receiveth it. He loves it instantly. Instant gratification, instant satisfaction. This seed is what I was looking for. 21, yet, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Here's a man that took what he got. I was really glad to get it. And then as soon as he got it, uh, it didn't have any depth of earth. Didn't have any time to grow. Couldn't get any uh, roots going. Yet he had not root in himself. It tried to grow a root, but there was no ground to grow it in. He had not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. The same thing that he got all excited about is the same thing that offended him. That's the guy that comes into church and he says, man, I just love this. I just need this fellowship. I just haven't had this in years, man. I haven't been in church in so long. i got to come back. And then you never see him again. <laughs> like, What's the matter, brother? The, the matter is that anon, with joy, he receives it, but he won't develop any roots because he won't get committed. And when a little trouble comes up, he gets offended by the word. That's the Lord doing it. And then he passes along the se off of the scene. 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. That implies that he was able to bear fruit or he was beginning to bear fruit, but he became unfruitful. So the first two guys are unsaved. But the thorny guy, he's saved. He grew up in the thorns, and he did okay, except that the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choked him out. Verse 23, here's the one to be. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. How much does he bring forth? Some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. The Lord gives every man the ability to bear fruit, and it's just up to him to re let the seed grow in the ground and for him to respond properly to the sunshine and to the water, to the rain, and to what the Lord's doing in his life. You know that same seed that got burned up because it was by the wayside, the sun came and scorched it? It was the same sun that came on the seed on the good ground and caused it to grow. And it's the same God that rules to th on the just and the unjust. And the same thing that will cause one guy to drown will cause another guy to grow and blossom and bear fruit. And it's a matter of your heart and how you take what the Lord's doing in your heart. I'd like to get to this next parable here, verse 24. We'll finish with this one. Verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Another seed parable. Yep. Yep. And if you have any wisdom, you'll take common everyday things that you see in life and use car wrecks and checks bouncing and all different illustrations that you have to explain spiritual things. You know, these people saw every day, all, every year, they saw people throwing seed on the ground. And Jesus said, you know what the kingdom of heaven is like? It's like that guy you saw on the way here just has a bag of seed and throwing it out there. Here's how it's like that. And you ought to take regular common illustrations of today and use them to get the word of God across to people. It's like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? 
And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. And the servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Let's undo what was done. But he said, Nay. You know what I would like to do? I can't say it all being recorded live, what I'd like to do. You know what I'd like to do with the tares in this world? I'm a fixer, man. If you come to me with your problem, my mind goes into fifth gear, and I am on fixing mode, and I will find a solution to your problem, even if it's the wrong one. I want to get the thing fixed. I know that's not super mature, and I'm working on that. But <laughs> some things don't need fixed. Sometimes the Lord puts you in a pickle so that you have to learn how to get out of it, right, and learn some things through it. We heard about that this morning. All right. I want to take a situation, and I want to make it right and start the millennium tomorrow. That's what I want to do. And that's what these servants want to do. Let's go clean up the field, pull all the tares. Let's rip them all out of the ground and throw them away. Wouldn't that be the easiest time to do it is right now? And what does he say? He said, verse 29, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. You know how much damage you would do right now if you just uh, started your hitman ministry for the Lord and took out all the wicked people as, under your assessment? You became judge, jury, and executioner in your town, and you just started the vigilante pro thing all over again and said, the law is not doing good enough. I'm going to start a, a task force. I'm going to join the Second Amendment. I'm going to be in the militia in, in Yellowstone. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know what you would do? You'd make a huge, rotten, stinking mess. Because the one thing that you failed to overlook is that the Lord knows what's going on that you know that's going on, and he has chosen not to fix it. Yes, he might have chosen it for punishment for other people, and he might have put a judges in the land that are just as wicked as the people in the land because it's a just recompense of their reward. And who are you and I? Well, just a bunch of little kernels of wheat that got to live along with it and got to deal with it. If all those people got rooted up and picked up and plucked up and destroyed, you know how many other people would get destroyed with it? Because the Lord's doing something in your heart and in your life because he's watching the response to you to the wickedness in this world. You can take any situation that comes in this world and you can live through it in righteousness. Any situation, whether it's with your boss or whether it's the worst sin and atrocity that men can commit with other men whether it's being tortured for the name of Jesus Christ or anything in between, you can take a situation of wicked men, of tares that have been sown in this world by the enemy, and you can live that thing in righteousness for the Lord. And the Lord will work something in you that would have torn you up if you just in, in eradicated the problem. Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. You need the trouble. You need the sorrows. You need the things in this life so that those rocks jostling together in a stream get rubbed against each other, and that stream is just jostling those rocks all the time, all the time, rubbing them smoother and smoother and smoother. And you say, I don't like being in the stream next to these rough, these rough old rocks, and I got these people talking bad about me, and I got this family member that's lying about me, and I got this situation at work where they just are uh, taking advantage of me. You need those rocks that are jostling up against you to smooth you out, whether they ever get smooth or get right or not, you need those things so that you can be a smooth stone in the pouch of David, in the pouch of your Savior, that he can use you when the time is right so that he can go, you can glorify him. Verse 30, let both grow together. You're not going to get out of it until the millennium. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The explanation is just across the page in verse 39 and 40. We'll probably pick it up here next time, but look at 39 and 40. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the church age. Is that what it says? It does not say that. He said, I thought all those tares are going to get burned up in the fire and then God's going to have judgment and then there's going to be a rapture and we're going to go through the tribulation. No, it doesn't say that. It wasn't even talking to you. It wasn't even talking to the church age. It's talking to the church age and the tribulation saints combined. And that's how the mystery kingdom parables work. The enemy that sowed them, verse 39, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. That's the end of this world before the millennium begins. The harvest is the end of the world. 
and the reapers are the angels, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. I've shown you that in Isaiah 66, where the fire is on the earth, and they're burned and gathered together in a lake of fire on earth in the area of the Dead Sea today. Zephaniah 3, Matthew 3.10, Isaiah 66. So shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun, Malachi 4, in the kingdom of their fathers. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. All right, we're going to stop there. All those kingdom parables are like that where they're overlapping these time frames and I just preached it to you to the church and then showed you it overlaps all the way through the tribulation. And all of them are like that. I've already gone in detail about the sower and the seed. That was on, uh, if anybody wants details on that, I wrote down the date. It's kind of hard to find online. Uh, October 24th, 2021. So less than a year ago, we already taught on the sower and the seed, and I went into great detail about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and how those one of those... The second one is actually pictured of a tribulation saint who believes for a while and he has some eternal life. It looks like he gets, a, he gets everlasting life or gets saved, so to speak, and then he loses his salvation. All that we covered in much greater detail, but all of these mysterious kingdom parables are going to overlap and have different applications to the church through all, all the way into the end of the tribulation. So. I've been a little bit dreading this, but as soon as I was able to put some time into it and study it, um, there's so much there's so much stuff in here that just explains Revelation, and I've got Revelation on the list for, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know what's on the list. I have five ideas for Wednesday night after we finish this discipleship while I get discipleship two ready. Revelation is one of them, so p please uh, be in prayer about that. It might be Revelation, might be four other things. Okay, Lord, I ask that you please uh, bless the lesson tonight. Lord, I thank you for uh, the place and time you put us in this earth that we get to see these things. It seems like a lot of things are tying together and wrapping up, Lord, and, and none of us can get the timing and calendar figured out for the whole thing, Lord. But, Lord, if we're here near at the end of it and there's going to be a lot more people falling away and things get worse and worse and more thorns choking out more Christians, Lord, I ask that you please help us to look to you and make sure that we uh, pull the weeds and get the thorns out in that parable and take the weeds in the other parable and live with them and grow through the troubles and the problems that you put us put us it with, that we come out of it uh, glorifying you. And Lord, I ask to please bless the lessons tonight and I ask that you bless them as we uh, continue through these passages. Uh, help me to teach them correctly. I ask you help me to teach them so that uh, people are edified and uh, that some, some more of the Bible pieces and parts fit together and make sense. I ask you to bless this as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen.